Doctor Who Apollo 23 by Justin Richards. The look of surprise on the man's face made it worth it. Amy didn't like the spacesuit. It was tight in all the wrong places. The helmet was claustrophobic, like someone had stuck a goldfish ball over her head. She could hear her own breathing, pardon me, and the whole thing was, pardon me, just not quite her shade of red, pardon me, pardon me. It didn't help that the doctor's voice, pardon me, was an enthusiastic blast in her ears, and she didn't know how to turn the volume down. Either the suit volume or the volume of the doctor's excitement as he bounced happily across the barren lunar surface. But it was all worth it when she was standing beside the doctor at the edge of the crater, at the edge of a crater, behind a man in a bulky white suit. The doctor reached out and tapped the man on the shoulder. He turned slowly clumsily in the little hopping movements. His eyes were already wide and anxious through the faceplate. When he saw the doctor and Amy standing there, the man took a step backwards and almost fell. His eyebrows shot upwards as if to escape from his jaw. as it dropped in the opposite direction. Whoa, where did you come from? Oh, whoa, where did you come from? An American voice gasped in Amy's ear. The doctor gestured vaguely back over his shoulder. Amy grinned. Is there another base? The man shook his head inside his helmet, which didn't move. No, no way. We'd know. Just visiting, the doctor told him. Amy could see from his expression that the man could hear. The doctor must have opened their radio link to include him. I gather you're having a problem with your qu- with your quantum displacement. Oh, I gather you're having a problem with your quantum displacement. You're from Hibiscus? Well, we're from TARDIS, actually, but we can sort that out inside. So what are you up to? Amy asked, as much to prove she could speak as anything. Just getting some, just getting some fresh air? Recovery team. He turned in cumbersome, bouncing steps. Maybe this spacesuit wasn't so bad after all, Amy decided. It certainly seemed easier to move in it, and the whole thing was much less bulky. Recovery, the doctor said. You've been ill? Some sort of therapy? We recover stuff from inside here. No. We recover stuff from outside here. Uh, outside from here, on the surface, equipment, monitoring systems, solar panels that need replacing, sometimes just rocks for Jackson's people to examine. On today? Amy asked. The man paused in his bouncing, lolloping walk. He half turned, then seemed to decide it was too much effort and started bouncing off again. Today, he said. We were recovering the body. They crested a shallow rise in the ground. The lip of another enormous crater, Amy realized. Ahead of them, the them, the ground sloped away again towards a cluster of low rectangular buildings connected by even lower rectangular corridor sections. The whole thing looked like it had been made out of enormous egg boxes for some children's school project. Just a short way ahead of them were several more astronauts in identical bulky white suits. Two of them carried a stretcher 
Amy couldn't make out the detail of what was on it. Just a flash of bright red. Incongruous against the grey of the moon's surface. Who was she? Uh, the doctor asked. His eyesight must be better. Don't know yet. Some poor woman and her dog. They walk, they walk right through the displacement field and wound up here, dead, suffocated in moments. Like that poor guy in the park, Amy said. The field must have displaced, uh, the, the field must have dissipated round him, the doctor said thoughtfully. That poor woman walked right into it. A walk in the park becomes a moonwalk. And we just lost Marty Garrett. Guessing he was the guy who... Uh, get, guessing he was the guy who walked off the moon into the burger bar? Amy said. Seems likely, the doctor agreed. They walked on in silence for several minutes. As they got closer, Amy could see that the moon base in front of them was much larger than she had thought. The box-like modules rose high above them like office blocks. It's so big, she said. Most of it will be storage, the doctor told her. Water, air, food, that sort of thing. Thank goodness, the astronaut said. They were talking a couple of years ago about just piping water and air in direct from base, hibiscus, and not storing anything locally. If they'd done that, we'd be working out whether we'd die of thirst before oxygen starvation. Now the quantum link's gone down. The thing that lets you walk from Earth to the moon? Amy said. Or pipe water and air through, the astronaut said. Luckily, the tanks have been kept full through the quantum link and underground res and the underground reservoir. We should be okay for three months. You'll have fixed it by then, right? He sounded like he was joking. The doctor didn't answer. So where's the earth? Amy asked, changing the subject. Shouldn't we be able to, shouldn't we be able to see it? This is the dark side of the moon, the doctor told her. But it isn't dark. It's called the dark side. That's not because it's actually dark. Well, not unless it's night time. It's because it always faces away from the earth. Dark is, dark isn't, dark as in unknown, like the dark continent. Or dark chocolate, Amy said. Exactly what? Kidding, she told him. The astronaut led them to a doorway. It was thick metal with a locking wheel on the, on the outside. A red light glowed above the wheel. Through a small window set in the door, Amy could see the other astronauts carrying the stretcher through a similar door, which they closed behind them. The glass was so thick that the image was distorted. A green light replaced the red one above the locking wheel, and the astronauts spun it, then pulled the heavy door open. As he turned to allow Amy and the doctor inside, Amy saw his shoulder had a U.S. flag emblazoned on it. Beneath that was printed Reeve. Inside the sealed airlock, there was a hiss as the small room pressurized. As soon as they were through the inner door, the astronaut reached up and twisted his helmet 
then lifted it from his head. Beneath it, he was wearing a white balaclava, which he also tugged off, revealing short black hair. His face was rugged and but handsome, and his eyes were as grey as surface of the moon. The doctor helped Amy remove her helmet before taking off his own. The astronaut's eyes widened as Amy's red hair cascaded out over her shoulders. She laughed. Don't you have girls in space? <laughs> the astronaut smiled. We got a few. I'm Reeve, by the way. Captain Reeve, Captain Jim Reeve. He put his helmet on a shelf next to a dozen other identical helmets. They were in a large locker room with shelves and cupboards where the spacesuits and equipment were stored. The doctor was already struggling out of his suit. He still wore his jacket slightly crumbled underneath. Me suits, Reeve commented. They just may be quite new. They must be quite new. Newer than you think, the doctor said, glancing at Amy. No items, I noticed. Reeve tapped the name badge on his shoulder. I need to see some ID before I break the news to Colonel Devonish that we got company. I'd have thought he'd be glad of some help, Amy said. You'd think that, yeah, from his tone, it was an expectation that was probably not going to be fulfilled. Well, I'm Amy, Amy Pond. And this is the doctor. And you're here to fix the quantum displacement? Absolutely, the doctor agreed. Only since it fell big time, how exactly did you get there? And only because it's only since it fell big time, how exactly did you get here? Oh, we have our own portable system, the doctor said. Keep it in a box. A box? The box is blue. Yeah, we got a signal about that. Going to bring it into base. So that's something else that's got smaller then? Reeve said. We keep our quantum displacement system in a whole module. In a whole module. Rooms of equipment. No idea what it does. Oh, the theory's easy enough, the doctor assured him. It's like quantum entanglement, only different. Instead of tying atoms and molecules together so they exhibit the same behaviour, you tie whole different locations together so they become the same place. Oh yeah, easy, Amy said. Reed laughed. <laughs> All I know is I can walk from here along the predefined path and end up in the Texan desert outside base hibiscus and the hibiscus folks can walk through the desert and get to the moon so long as it works that's all I'm interested in except it doesn't work the doctor said and you people are dead like that woman and her dog Amy added. Yes, the doctor said. Which all suggests a sudden failure. Then the system corrected itself. So that the man in the park ended up back in the park. And now you say it's bust again. Totally, Reeve agreed. I don't suppose you have a lead? The doctor asked. None at all. Old Jackson and the scientists are working on it, but... 
Reed's voice tailed off as he saw the doctor's expression. It was a mixture of amusement and sympathy. For the dog, the doctor said. I mean, was the dog on a lead? Reed blinked. I guess so. I don't know. Is it important? No idea, the doctor admitted. But it would prove the woman and the dog are in a, are an item, as it were, rather than random dog and accidental woman. Oh, we got ID from Base Hibiscus, if it's what you mean. If that's what you mean. So you know who she is? Amy asked. And the dog? The doctor checked. Yeah. It's just you guys I'm not sure about, Reed told them. Have you got any ID before I go tell the colonel that the cavalry has arrived? Think we might have strayed in too? Amy asked. It happens wildlife strays in occasionally. Not a lot of it from the desert. And the dispersal link is only open at scheduled times. Had an eagle fly right through the gateway once. Dropped dead, of course. I admit accidents like that don't normally wear spacesuits. But you turn up out of nowhere claiming to know all about the secret U.S. project and... With all due respect, you guys don't sound very American. The doctor flipped open his wallet of psychic paper. We've come to help. Here you go, he said, waving it under Reeves' nose. Not oh, Reeves' nose. Our access all areas pass from base hibiscus. Allows us to go anywhere, see anything, talk to anyone. Captain Reeves nodded. It does that, he agreed. Just one thing, though. Why is it printed back to front? Back to front. The doctor frowned. I told you that would never work. He said to. I told you that would never work. He said to Amy. He ruined it. I didn't say. Well, I didn't say so. Signed his name on it. Ruined it. He stuffed the wallet back inside his pocket. Amy ignored him. It's a security... It's a security thing, she told Reed. Makes it harder to forge. So can we... Can we see Colonel Devonish now? Now, please? And that was chapter three. Of Apollo 23. Next time we get into chapter 4. Until then, thank you for watching.